before I start this morning, I've always got lots of stuff going through my head. And because uh, when you come out of like a bit of worship and I always find God speaks to me so much during worship, I often have my Bible in my hand. And, and uh, if we're singing scripture, I, I might turn to scripture and read and I believe God is speaking to me. And you know, that great old Boney M song, By the Rivers of Babylon. And uh, just the old people will remember that. And uh, this is where we sat down. This is a scripture, see. And we remembered what? Zion. See, they were taken captive. They were taken captive, these people. And, and they were the people of God. And their captors, they said to them, why don't you sing us some of those God songs? Some of those songs you sing. And they said, how can we sing when we're stuck in a land that's not ours? When we're, when we're in captivity? How do you expect us to sing? And the Bible says they hung their harps on the willows. They put their instruments away. Music's over. We're not singing. We're in captivity. My goodness, that's the best time to sing. They were told to sing and they wouldn't sing. And I was thinking about that this morning and about captivity. And then I started to think about Babylon and Daniel and how, and how King Nebuchadnezzar, this was about 600 years BC, and King Nebuchadnezzar sent uh, to actually take people captive from Jerusalem and take them into their own land. And I want you to think about this because this was a long time ago, right? 600 years BC. There was lots of times, there were several different times when the people of God were taken captive. And I want to tell you today, this is prophetically, I'm speaking this morning, that this is happening right now. The people of God are being taken captive by this world. We're seeing it right across uh, the world right now where you, you may still be in church on a Sunday morning but the world has got you captive. They've taken people captive this morning. And what, and what Babylon did with the people of God when they took, they took the cream of the crop, they took the best people. They didn't take everyone. In, in the, the first time when, when Daniel went, there was only a few hundred and, and then the next time there was a few thousand and the next time there was a few more thousand. You can go read some of this stuff. I don't know, they don't say exactly how many people were taken. I was reading some commentaries last night. There may have been about 20,000 people were taken captive by Babylon out of God's people. But the thing that amazed me out of all the people that were taken captive, there was only four of them that got talked about. Four of them that stood up against what, the, what uh, Babylon was trying to do to them. Because what they did, they, they didn't take them captive and put them in prison and whip them and put them in chains or anything like that. No, no. They took all the best people and they took them into Babylon and they fed them all the best food. And they dressed them in all the best clothes. And then they changed their names even. See, they, what they wanted to do was convert them to their culture. They wanted to breed, their Babylon wanted to breed their culture into these people of God. They wanted to teach, give them new names, uh, teach them a new language. I don't know if there's anyone here that grew up speaking a language that you can't speak anymore. I know Nikita's one. I saw you on TV singing in Cambodian. What's the name of their language? Yeah, this girl was in, in Cambodia as a baby singing in a talent show on, on TV as a little child. Do you speak Cambodian now? No. See, this is what happened to the people of Israel. They wanted to take them and teach them a new language and let them forget what they had under God. I ain't even started preaching. I'm not preaching on this. This is what God spoke to me in worship this morning. And I see this as a 21st century captivity that 
the enemy has come and he's taken people of God and he's trying to infiltrate them into the world culture. He's trying to teach them a new language. He's dressing them in different clothes, so to speak, and converting them to be like the world. But he doesn't mind them still coming back into the church so that they can convert some others. And the church should be different people of God. We should be different to the world, but we're not. Only four, the Bible talks about standing up and going against what Babylon wanted to do. They tried to stop them praying. They tried to stop them reading the word. They tried to stop them following their God. And I tell you what, this is, you're probably going to hear this week in and week out. They're, They're coming for you. But if you will stand like Daniel, And if you'll stand like Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, oh, they'll they'll try and kill you. But they couldn't, could they? Because God was with them. Daniel said, I don't want to eat your food. And he said, test me in this, that if I don't participate in your ways, that I will be better off than all the people who do. So hundreds and thousands of people were taken out of Israel and they were taken captive by Babylon and we don't hear of them standing up. They thought, most of them thought, like a lot of people in church today, that the world is pulling airway. Oh, it's quite nice. They're, like They've got some nice stuff. You know, I weren't eating this good in Jerusalem. I'm eating better now. And Daniel said, I will not eat your food. Isaiah said, and in that day, seven women will take a hold of one man, saying, let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. But let us eat our own food and wear our own clothes. He's not talking about your fashion. He's talking about wearing your rags of righteousness or Jesus' righteousness. His cloak of righteousness. Speaking the word of God or speaking the trash of this world. Oh my goodness, Pastor, you're getting into something now. Because I want to tell you this morning, I want to go back a bit further than 600 years BC this morning. I want to go back about 1400 years BC. Turn with me to the book of Psalms this morning, to Psalm 78. Cool, if you don't get anything else, you've got a good sermon already this morning. (laughs) Glory to God. They're after you. And I'll tell you what they're after first. They're after your Bible. Do you know there's places in the world where the Bible's banned? They're already taking it off the shelves in some shops in America today. And we're never very far away from America, are we? Whatever they do wrong, we follow suit. What is wrong with us? Psalm 78. Where are we going? Help me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. What I want to say this morning, something that Daniel knew and the the three boys that they threw into the fire, something that they knew was how powerful God was. God was able to shut the mouths of lions for Daniel. God was able to protect those boys in a fiery furnace. And you better believe that was true. That's not a made-up story. God is so powerful. Ephesians 3.20 says that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ask or even think. Amen? That's That's a good scripture. And you know just thinking about communion there. And in Luke 24, on the Emmaus Road story, Jesus is walking with those disciples on the Emmaus Road and they get to the town where they were living and they say to him, stop with us. And he said, he would have gone further. Jesus will always go further than you want to go. He will always take you as far as you want to go and he will go further with you. He will take you on. See, a lot of people, they say, oh, I have this vision, I want to do this, I want to do this. Jesus wants much more for you. Don't be limited 
by your own limitations and don't limit God who is unlimited. Amen? Let me show you in Psalm 78. This is talking about Israel coming out of Egypt and into the desert. Verse, we'll just do 40 to 43. Psalm 78. How often they provoked him in the wilderness. Do you know the story of the, the people of Israel leaving Egypt and how they just whinged and complained? For what I, And as I just said, they went over the Red Sea. They saw the miracle of God. They, that's before the Red Sea, they'd seen the miracle of the plagues in Egypt. They'd seen his hand of power, all the great things that he'd done. It says, how often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God, underline this one in your Bible, and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the unlimited God. Because sometimes we know how powerful God is, but you ain't got a clue. You know about it that much of how powerful God is in the light of eternity. He is more powerful, greater, more loving, more kind, more compassionate than you will ever even think up in this life because your mind is finite. And you're trying to think of a God who is infinite, a God who is unlimited, great power, and we've got to start, I know that your mind is limited, but you've got to start to exercise your mind because the Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. You don't have a limit on your mind for God. We only limit ourselves by what we can see and what we know. So we have to start to dream again, people. You had a dream once. And your dream was like, so big and so vast that you thought that could never come to pass. So you, you dumb it down to the point where it seems manageable for you. But God is so big, so great. The Bible says that that word limited is only in the, is in the King James Version and it's... It, it's used differently, it's rendered differently in other translations. But do you know, I find that when, when we limit God, what we do is we diminish our faith or we diminish our expectation of God. And our expectation of God needs to be great. I love the story of Peter and John going to the temple and they come across the lame man sitting at the gate, remember? The gate called Beautiful. And, and he asks them for money. And then, like, it's like most pastors, his pockets were empty. Peter, don't you believe it? God is good to me. And Peter said, silver and gold I have not. But he said something before that. He said to that lame man, he said, look at us. And that's not even the great bit about that scripture. The great bit about that scripture is the lame man, the man who couldn't help himself, the man who couldn't do anything for himself. It says he looked at them expecting to receive something. Expecting to receive something. Expectation will, will take your faith higher. See, we say we've got expectation or we've got faith. We have faith to believe God for this. I have faith to believe God for that. But do you expect God to do it? Do you expect God? Now, I hope your faith is lined up with God's will. Same as your prayers. See, Israel knew his power. They'd seen it. But they forgot. They forgot. And I'm trying to encourage you to remember some of the things that God has done in your life. Some of the great things you've seen. Some of the miracles that you've seen. I want to talk about four things this morning for just a few minutes. 
to actually say that this is an area where we have diminished our expectation in God. And we need to start to lift our faith, people of God. See, Jesus meets us where our faith is at, right? According to your faith, let it be done. You know, when, when he was uh, with, the, with the guys in the boat, he said, where's your faith? Why are you not using your faith? Oh, ye of little faith. See, little faith believes that God doesn't care. Because they said, Master, we are drowning. We are dying. Don't you care? And he said, oh, you of little faith. Little faith people believe that God don't care. Why isn't God doing anything for me? Don't he care for me? Oh, ye of little faith. When Jairus comes to Jesus, he says, Lord, my daughter is dying. Come to my house and she will be healed. He knew Jesus could do it, but his faith was in a place where Jesus had to come himself and do it. Pray for her. When the centurion soldier come to Jesus, he says, my servant is at home with the palsy. He's sick. And, he, and Jesus said, I'll come. And he said, you don't need to come. Just say the word. And my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, I haven't seen such great faith in all of Israel. See, little faith believes Jesus don't care. Great faith trusts the word of God, believes the word of God. Jesus will meet you wherever your faith is at. That's why we need to extend our faith. We need to grow our faith. We need to up our faith levels. And there's only one way you can up your faith level, people of God. And that's by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and by hearing the Word of God. So if you're not a Bible reader, your faith is always going to be stunted. You may have faith to believe Jesus saves you, and that's great, but you're never going to be able to extend your expectation and your faith unless your faith is built by the Word of God. Amen? We don't want to diminish our expectation. Remember this scripture, Malachi 3.6 says, I am the Lord, I changeth not. And this is... Because what's happening today is we're getting people speaking into our lives who are saying, yeah, God did miracles back then and he did that back then and he did that back then, but he's not doing it today. I am the Lord who changeth not. And Jesus said, I am the same yesterday, today and forever in the book of Hebrews. Amen. So we need to believe if Jesus was healing back then, if God was healing before we knew who Jesus was, back in the Old Testament, He's doing it today. And we need to up our faith level, people of God, in the area, especially in the area of healing. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, and Peter said that uh, this Jesus, <coughs> who God has anointed with the Holy Ghost and power, he went about doing good to all and healing all who were sick. Jesus was the healer. Je you need to read some of those books. You know, Jesus, the healing books, you need, and they're full of scripture. They're full of faith-building stuff. You not get any better faith-building stuff than this, all right? But when you read a book that's based upon the Word of God, then you can be sure that your faith will be built. Hang out with people who function in God and they will lift your faith. I had lunch with two friends on Thursday, and, uh, you know, I went, I went into that restaurant and two hours later, and I'd have still been there, had my parking ticket not run out in two hours, and uh, I left there and I felt that I could do anything. <laughs> like this man of God that I was talking with, he's, uh, he was just, he's just so faith-filled and so encouraging and so positive. Like I was sitting there listening. And he said, do you remember when you did this? Do you remember when this happened? Do you remember this? Do you remember when we did this? And I'm like, Ooh, I think I was like a little bit taller when I come out of that place. See, but it wasn't just Jesus, was it? Peter healed the sick. 
laid hands on the sick. But it's in the power of Jesus' name and in the power of God. Remember when he laid... When, uh, my favourite one of Peter was when he lays hands on the guy, at, an, a guy called Aeneas. And he said, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. That was his prayer. Can you, can you pray like that? Can you pray like when you have a friend or a family member sick? You know, you don't have to go into an hour of prayer. Take a, steal that prayer off of Peter. He could do it. And you can do it too. Put your hand out on them and say, Kerry, Jesus the Christ heals you. Amen. Amen. See, I didn't even say amen. I said amen on purpose there. Amen. Jesus the Christ heals you. Paul prayed for the sick. And the Bible says in, in, in Mark 16 to go lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Do you do that? I find that the best way to, to preach the gospel, not so much here in Australia, but in India where I go, they've never heard the name of Jesus. So you're trying to tell people about a God they've never heard of. They've heard of all these other gods, but you tell them about Jesus and uh, maybe it's just another story about another God, but I'm about to demonstrate the power of God. I want to show them that God is real and that he can do stuff. So I want, to, before I, I want to lead them to Christ, before I want to lead them to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, first of all, I've got there, I want them to know that He's real and that He's the one who saves. So I, quite, I ask them sometimes, how many of you have prayed to your God for healing? And most of them have. How many of you have been healed? None of them have because their gods can't heal. So I said, let me show you. I, I, like, I like playing Elijah on Mount Carmel. So I like to say, come on. Let, let me show you the God who answers by fire or the God who answers with power is the real God. And you can lay hands on them in the name of Jesus. I don't, like, I don't even understand what they're asking for, but God does. No good me saying what's wrong with you. They don't even understand me. So my interpreter says, if you need healing, God is going to show you how he really is. Because Paul says that I don't come with words of men, but in demonstration of the power of God. Amen. So that's what we need. In the power of Jesus' name, I declare you totally healed right now. And we say that and God heals them. And so I have a problem with people who say that Jesus doesn't heal today. Well, I couldn't do it. I couldn't even administer a Panadol. But God can heal. And we mustn't forget this because we, we get sick and we go, oh, um, it's okay, I'll just take another couple of tablets. or you know. But no, we've got to get into our Bible and get our faith levels up and believe that God is the healer, Malcolm. He's the healer. Trust him, he will heal you. I believe it with all my heart. So I'd like to go to the Old Testament. I'd like to come to the New Testament. I'd like to come up to date, but I think I said enough about healing. I am the Lord who healeth thee, he said in the book of Exodus. That's his name. Jehovah Rapha, they called him. The God who heals. I believe it. You need to pray for your kids. Pray for each other. Pray for yourself. He's the God who heals. I said that we started with this this morning. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. And forget not all of his benefits, who forgives all our iniquities and heals all our diseases. I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. I am the God who changeth not. God's a healer. But you know, I, I, was, I was listening to a great preacher and uh, preaching a good word and and he said some stuff that got into my spirit and I started to diminish my expectation. I started to question whether God is healing today. And I, I, I could never question that. I've, I've laid hands on the blind and they've received their sight. I've laid hands on the deaf and they've received their hearing. I've laid hands on the dead and they've come to life. And if you doubt me, 
then you can only ask the other person who was with me <coughs> at the time was James Jacob and I was in India. I was in Tamil Nadu and I was in a meeting one night and I was about to preach and they worship forever like you're almost like you're sitting there for two hours sometimes just singing and you're waiting to get up to preach and you don't know whether you're ever going to get up anyway. And then I, just as I thought I was about to get up, there was a commotion in the building and I thought that we was being attacked by radical Hindus and so I'm looking for the exit, ready to run and uh, I'm not very brave. And uh, I, I said to someone the other day, death doesn't worry me. Dying doesn't bother me. It's how I die that bothers me. And so there was this big commotion. People were pushing through the crowd and they were talking to Jacob and they were speaking Tamil. And the only thing I know in Tamil is kapi vernum. That means, can I have a cup of, I, I would like a cup of coffee. And uh, so, uh, and, so uh, and I said, what's happening? He said, come, we've got to go. I said, I haven't preached yet. And that's the only thing I really like doing because I can't understand their worship. I just like worship God in my own way. And so I get up and it takes me out. They put me in a car. They drive me 10 minutes down the road. We stop and we've got to walk up through the bear infested tea plantations. And we get to this house and before I can see the house, I can hear the crying, the weeping and the wailing. And I said, what's, what's happening? No one's talking to me in English. What's happening? Where are we going? Are we going to pray for somebody? I said, what's wrong with them? They said, he's dead. And I said, it's a bit late, isn't it? That was me, this great man of faith, right? It's a bit late, isn't it? So I get there, I want to pray for the family for comfort. Man of faith. Holy Spirit of comfort. Come and touch this family, Lord. Help them grieve their, grieve their loved one. We're going to pray for him. So I go into this house, which is about two, four square meters, and he's not there. I said, where is he? And they said, he's under there. And they covered him up with sacks. He died in the morning. This was about eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night. And so I, I never prayed for a dead person before. I thought only Catholics prayed for the dead. And so we uncover him and I put my hand on him. I like, I don't know what he's died of. So I put my hand on him and I'm praying like this, Father in heaven, thank you for the life of this man. <laughs> Lord, bless this household. And Jacob's looking at me and he's going, what are you doing? I said, I don't know what to pray. And suddenly, the Spirit of God that lives in me rose up within me. And I started to pray in tongues. And then out of my mouth come, in the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of death to come off him right now and let life flow through this body. And that was, you know, when you see on the movies, or you may have even seen it on yourself, you may have had like the doctor get those things clear, you know, what are they called? Yeah, you got them. And, and it was like that. As I put my hands on, the man leapt. And I started laughing. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know, like... <laughs> and Jacob looked at me and he started laughing. And like, then we started to praise God. And this man was alive. And all his family came in. And they were all kneeling on the floor around us. You know, like some of you Indian people know, what well, they all want to touch your feet and, and worship you. So it's, no, no, Jacob, interpret this. What happened here is God Almighty, the power of God. And that family gave their life to Christ that night. And he is still one of our evangelists today. I know the power of God. And if God can raise the dead, He can dispel cancer out of your body. He can open your ears. He can open your eyes. He can do anything. Our God is such a good God. And I hope my brother Jacob listens to this message online because he's going to get excited too. 
I'll never forget. Some things that will happen in your life you will never forget. You need to get out there and start laying hands on the sick and watch God do miracles. Amen? He can do anything. Not only in the area of healing, but the whole miraculous world. It's anything that God do is miraculous. There's a story in 2 Kings in chapter 4. I was thinking of this yesterday. Where Elisha, let's turn there. Turn with me, 2 Kings. Let me read it from the Word. Chapter 4. Let me read. Because this is exciting. I might not even get to the last couple. I might just... A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. The creditor is coming to take my sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? And she didn't say, Raise her husband from the dead. Maybe she was glad he'd gone. I don't know. Didn't hear anyone say amen either. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? Because remember, she said, her husband's dead. The breadwinner's gone. Now, I owe money. The creditors are coming to take my sons to put them into slavery, to pay the debt. So here comes the answer. What shall I do for you? Tell me what you have in your house. And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. Then he said, you need to read this story for what it, what it is. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Now underline these next words. Do not gather just a few. God was wanting to do something that was unlimitless. Amen? He was about to do something. He's about to do something powerful in your life, yet you're going to limit him by saying, yeah, this is what I want. This is all I want. Oh, Lord, if you just give me this. Who prays those type of prayers? I do. Like I've got a, an idea in my mind that, Lord, if you just, when I used to pray about finances, Lord, if you just give me more work. If you just do this, if you just do this, if you just give me a new job, Lord, if you just give me some, just give me a pay rise. Give me a pay rise, make me the boss. So I can give myself a pay rise. Don't, do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, pour it into all the vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went from him, shut the door behind her. Oh, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a word in a minute that's actually going to really help you in this area and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass, when the vessels were full, she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. There's something happened here. So he told her to go into her room, right? Now you've got to remember that the word of God that came to the people in the Old Testament were from the prophets of God. The prophet of God was the man of God who brought the word of God. The word of God said to her, go into your room and do this and do that. And then verse 5 says, so she went into her room and shut the door behind her. Did exactly what the word of God said. Obedience is the key. Obedience is always the key to blessing. King Saul thought he could do it another way. Samuel said to him, God requires obedience, not sacrifice. And she said, bring me another vessel. He said to her, there is none. And when all the vessels were full, the oil ran out. If she had 100,000 vessels, she hit God it would have filled 100,000 vessels. Because he's not limited. There is no limit to God's power. He is a miracle working God. Amen? He is. I learned a song the first year I was saved. I was in the Assemblies of God Church in Hyde Park. And there was a pastor there. His name, if you're watching on TV, thank you very much. His name was Ken Fletcher. He was John Fletcher's son. John was from Geraldton. And Ken Fletcher was the assistant pastor at that church. And I used to love it when he preached. I liked uh, Pastor Bob Stevenson when he used to preach. But I used to get excited when Ken Fletcher used to preach. He was my favorite. Did anyone know him? No one? He's not a very popular. No, he's, he's older than me. 
It's a wonder he's still alive. He's, but he's, and he taught me a song. He taught the congregation a song. I bet I was the only one who picked up on it. And I'm going to sing it to you. I'll cut it out of the video afterwards, Darcy, all right? <clears throat> many of you have heard me tell this story. I've only got so many stories, right? He taught me this song and I learnt it. This was about 35 years ago. And it goes like this. Expect a miracle every day. Expect a miracle when you pray. If you expect it, God will find a way to perform a miracle for you each day. Easy song, right? I've remembered that for all that time that that pastor taught me that song. And I sing it all the time because I expect my miraculous God to do miracles in my life. And he is continuing to do miracles in my life. And if you do not limit him, he will do far exceedingly abundantly more than you can ask or even think. Don't just ask for a few. How many miracles did Jesus do in Nazareth in Matthew 13, 58? The Bible says he went to his hometown and he went to the synagogue. Which was his problem. But he could not do many miracles there for two reasons. If you go read that story, first reason was unbelief. And the second reason was dishonor. Who are you? The carpenter's son. We know who you are. Dishonor. Unbelief. And Jesus couldn't do many miracles there. See, unbelief is, will diminish your expectation. When you start to disbelieve stuff that's in this word. Hey, there's some crazy stuff in here. Have you ever, you read it? There's stuff in here that you will never believe in your brain. <laughs> but I believe it. Just because I don't understand it doesn't mean to say I can't believe it. Hey, I use my telephone every day. I don't know how it works. 90% of what I do every day, I don't know how it works. But it works, so I believe it. I don't even know how a microwave works. I don't even, I'm going to ask Daryl later, how do I, when I turn my tap on, how does the water come out of there? You, you work for the water board, don't you? <laughs> you have to, like, I don't know how that works. I don't even know where it comes from. But I live in faith, and if I ever turn that tap on and the water don't come out, I'm more surprised. Whoa, what's happened? Nothing happened. So what you do is, we, we have faith in stuff and we believe stuff. We don't even know how it works. You might know, you might know how it works. I don't know. I turn a light on, electricians. It comes on. That light bulb has been invented for ages and I don't even know how it works. But I don't have to know how it works. My mind is not wired that way. Electrical wired that way. Okay? I just hit the button and it comes on. If I hit the button and it don't come on, what do I do? I don't even know. I, I know how to change a light bulb, right? What about God's provision? Go read your Bible. Genesis 22. Abraham called God Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. I've got to this age and God has looked after me. And I don't think he's going to stop now. He's my provider. Are you in need today? He is your provider. He is your provider. There's so many. I, I said, earlier I said in uh, Philippians 4.19, and my God, my God, not Paul's God, my God, because he's a personal God, he shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. For, go fulfill the scripture. Be a generous person. I'm not, that, this is not a, a plug to, to make you tithe or anything. Just be generous. Stop being so stingy. I love it. Pastor Jane said that once when James Jacob was here. She taught, said something about people being stingy and he didn't know that word. So then when he learns a word, he can't stop saying it. He's really funny. 
And so next time I went to India, he's preaching and he's used the word stingy. You know, there's not a Tamil word for it. So in, the, in speaking in Tamil or Malayalam, he goes stingy. And I thought, I know that word. Where did he get that from? I said, what are you talking about? He said, Pastor Jane taught me that. <laughs> Stop being stingy. Be, you have more than enough. Share. Oh, it's mine. Well, that's all you're ever going to have then. You start to learn when you give, when you sow seed. You reap harvest. Sow seed. And God's protection. We talked about Daniel and Meshach, Shadrach and Abednego. They're like supernatural protection. You've been supernaturally protected every day of your life. Yet you don't even know it. There's so many car accidents that you avoided because of God. And you didn't even know it. Some I've had, though, I wish you'd have stopped. Let me conclude. Matthew 9, 28. The man comes to Jesus. A blind man come to Jesus. And Jesus asked one question. Do you believe I can do this? Do you believe I can do this? And they said, yes, Lord, we believe. And he gave them their sight. Do you believe it? I want to challenge your belief this morning. Ah, we believe Jesus died for us 2,000 years ago, shed his blood so that we could be saved. Do you believe what he's doing today? Do you believe that this word is true? Can you raise your expectation? Can you raise your faith level? I want you to challenge yourself. And has my faith level diminished? Has my expect, expectation of a great God diminished? I would say in some of your cases, and in my case, yes. There's been times when I've had to pull myself up and say, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? That's not God thinking. Think like God. Come on, people. You call yourself believers. Why don't we believe? The trouble is, do you know what's happened? People have got in your ear. Paul says to the Galatians, who has bewitched you? Not what, who. You've been listening to stuff that's wrong. You've been listening to stuff that's untrue. You've been listening to people speaking to you and they've upset you and you're in the position that you are today because you believe the lie. You believe the lie. And instead of acting on the truth because you didn't know the truth, you thought that what they told you was the truth, but you never checked it out for yourself and your faith levels have dropped, your countenance has dropped and you're going through the motions. Come on, let's believe God again. Amen? Let's believe Him again. Let's believe what He says is true. Come on, Kerry, what you're doing, God is not to be, God is going to do what you're doing and more. You're not here for any other reason today that God needed you to hear this message today. <laughs> Love seeing you anyway, it's great. Let's believe Him again, people. Our God is limitless. Do not limit the limitless God. Amen? Amen? Father in heaven, I thank you for today. Lord, I feel excited today about your word. I feel excited about your power, your love, your compassion, the wonders that you want to do. Lord, we, we, we live in a world that's trying to diminish our expectation of you. We live in a world that will try to talk us out of even believing you let alone believing the things that you want to do in our lives. We're living in a world that's trying to take us captive and teach us a different way, but we don't want to know a different way. We want to know your way, Lord. We want to stick with your way. We're not going to hang our harps in the willows. We're going to sing a song. And Lord, I thank you for your word that Daniel never stopped praying and he never stopped reading your word. Otherwise, they, they would have still been in captivity. Lord, he read the words of your prophet Jeremiah 
and he read that their time was up. 70 years was their captivity. And he reminded you of your word, Lord. He said, Lord, we've been here for the time allotted. Set us free. And they were led out of captivity by the power of God. So, Father, I thank you today that my brothers and sisters in this place today will not be banned by this world, will not be banned by the lies and the lying symptoms of this world, but they would be set free by the truth of God's word. And we will believe again. We will dare to believe again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah.